ahead and get it started here. Welcome, everybody. But it didn't get the sound through. <laughs> I was calling the 1,222nd meeting of the Entomological Society of Washington. You mute it yourself, uh, Jamie. You mute it yourself. Oh, sorry. I think I did that. Oh, OK. Sorry. We're back I, on. I think did I did you that hear anything? Yeah, you changed your name to Anne Chazelle. But so I'm having trouble getting the sound to come through. OK. Technical difficulties. I think I'm unmuted now. For all those out there that are not muted, please do mute, you, mute yourself. And I'll start it all over again. Welcome to the 1,222nd meeting of the Entomological Society of Washington. Uh, today, October 7th, 2021. This is our first meeting uh, of the fall session following our summer recess. Uh, please be aware that this meeting is being recorded um, and it'll be posted on YouTube. You can remain completely anonymous if you don't share your video, even though your name shows here in our live uh, Zoom meeting, your, your name will not show in the recording. So you'll be, remain completely anonymous if you want to. Um, and the, so the recording from, uh, from tonight will be available on our YouTube channel and I'm gonna put a link to our YouTube channel in the chat, which I just did. Um, it's also, you can also go to YouTube and search NSOC Wash DC, and you'll find our, our YouTube channel there. That's got all of our um, talks that we've recorded over the past year since we've been uh, broadcasting over Zoom. One sort of cool note is I, I noticed our, our, uh, our talk from April by Chris Simon of this year on periodical cicadas has been viewed 781 times, uh, which is maybe in the grand scheme of things, not viral, but uh, it's kind of a lot for us. So that's kind of cool. Um, that was good to see. Okay, so first up for tonight will be uh, the reading of the minutes of, of the last meeting, which was the um, our May meeting in uh, May 6, 2021. So I'll ask uh, Gary Hebel if you would uh, read, the, read the minutes of the meeting. Okay. <clears throat> the 1221st regular meeting of the Entomological Society of Washington was convened by President J Jimmy Zenizer at 7 p.m. on the 6th of May, 2021. The meeting was conducted virtually with some 45 members and guests in attendance. Record Recording Secretary Gary Handel read the minutes of the April meeting and they were approved. Membership and Communication Secretary Elizabeth Young announced 11 new applicants for membership in the society. Cabrina Hughes, Alina Alvin Macian, George Eiffel, Kim Snyder, Emmy Keogh, Judy Gallagher, Abigail Martins, Hazen Buckley, Jeff Clark, Michael Merchant, and Tara Fresno. Elizabeth read for the second time the names of Juana Maria Coronado Blanco, Ava Karen Serrano Dominguez, and Christopher Owen, who are now officially members of the society. Program Chair Alan Norbaum introduced the speaker of the evening, Mark Branham from the University of Florida, whose topic was the evolution of bioluminescence signals in fireflies. Dr. Branham presented a review of his current research on fireflies providing details on field studies that reveal relationships of species in this fascinating family of beetles. The meeting was adjourned at 9 p.m. Okay, thanks very much, Gary. Um, do we have a motion to approve the minutes? Okay, I think I see Lourdes raising her hand to a motion. Does somebody second the motion? Second. Second. The reading of the minutes are approved. Thank you. 
Okay, the next section is reports from officers and committees. Are, are any of our officers here? Do they want to give any reports? I just want to say quickly uh, that the um, annual banquet uh, went off uh, just wonderfully. We, we had uh, a great speaker um, and great attendance this time. So the video will also be available on the YouTube channel. Chuck Tallamy was our speaker and it's a very interesting and very timely talk about uh, insect conservation. So I urge uh, everyone to, to check it out. Yep, thanks, Lourdes. It was good to see the return of the banquet. Um, of course, in 2020, it was canceled, well, first postponed, then ultimately canceled due to COVID restrictions. And so it was good to see it return this year in person and, and on Zoom. So um, big thanks to Lourdes for, for putting it all together. Um, it was uh, uh, a success, thanks. Okay, um, the next section is um, introduction of uh, new members and visitors. I, so Gary just read the uh, second reading of the, um, the new members. Um, so I won't repeat that, but we have over the summer, we've ha have some new members join. They are Jay Abercrombie, Brian Gelbert, Jeff Webb, Atilano Contreras Ramos, Rafael Colorado, Alexander Orfinger, and Brendan Randall. Uh, welcome everybody, uh, great to see you join. Um, always very happy to see new members join. So, so welcome. Okay, um, moving on our sort of standard progression of the um, of the uh, of the meeting, the next the next order of business would be any unfinished business. Does anybody have anything uh, withstanding from 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 the past year that they want to bring up? Um, any orders of business? Oh, sorry. Let me go back. Uh, no. Do we have Back to the um, the new members and visitors. Uh, if there are any uh, visitors here tonight uh, that would like to introduce themselves, I'd like to invite them to, so just, you can briefly unmute your microphone and say hello if you'd like to. There's no need to, but please feel free if you'd like to. Hello, I'm Stan Malcolm. I have a PhD from UConn in 81. Um, did a bunch of other things, but in retirement, came back to UConn as a volunteer and had a great time catching up on some of the I missed. Great. Thank you, Stan. Okay. Well, welcome, everybody. I think Mr. Hayworth was trying to introduce himself, uh, but he's muted. Come. Here we are. Yeah, I just wanted to say hello. I'm Dr. Martin Hayworth. I'm a research associate and volunteer, mainly dealing with Coleoptera in the Academy of Natural Sciences uh, in Philadelphia. Uh, I'm a retired academic physician and also a composer, which is my main second career with entomology as a lifelong avocation along with that. So nice to be a guest here. Thank you all very much. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you. Okay, I don't, we don't have anybody else introducing themselves, so I'm going to move on, but feel free to inter interrupt me if you'd like to introduce yourself. Okay, it sounded like we had no unfinished business. Um, new business, uh, I just have one thing to mention is that um, officer elections will be coming up. So uh, nominees for elected offices in, um, in our society will be announced in November. And then we'll, we'll vote on uh, the nominees 
in our annual meeting, which uh, is in December. It'll be on December 2nd of, of, of this year. Okay, so the next section is presentation of notes and exhibition of specimens. This is sort of, um, uh, there's a lot of freedom here. So it's sort of like our show and tell section. If you like, if you have anything of interest, I think at least we have at least one, but um, if you've got uh, something of interest to show, entomology related, preferably, uh, please, please present it. Al, would you like to go ahead and show your video? Yeah, sure. Um, this is actually um, one that Tina Litwack shared. Her son um, took this video sometime last week. Can you, can you see that, Jamie? No, I think you need to share your screen. Oh, I didn't do that right, I guess. All right. I've got too many windows open, sorry. I don't know how to get rid of this one. Uh, sorry about that. Um, So I'm clicking on the green button. What else do I need to do? Share screen. Does it come up with a little menu when you do that? Oh, maybe it's over here. Sorry. Do you see anything now? Yes. OK. Sorry, everyone. <laughs> um, sorry, Ty Litwack's son took this when he was out uh, hiking somewhere in the, in the woods. And uh, I thought it was very cool. I don't really know what they are, some kind of a pomoptera type uh, organism. I asked her if it, you know, was windy and they were, you know, blowing around. She said no, they were they were just wiggling. Anyway, mystery insect to me. I think I have an answer. You know what it yeah, is, Dave? Uh, I believe they're called woolly aphids. I don't know the uh, scientific name, but I've seen them before in the woods uh, doing the same things, you know, going back and forth. I've seen them on beach in Rock Creek. That's a cool video. <laughs> yeah. Guess we need to get Gary Miller to look at them and mm -hmm. confirm. Definitely. He's the one who told me what they were. So uh, yeah, he's he's the guy that I talked to. Okay. Neat. Thank you, Al. Anybody else have anything they'd like to show? Okay, with that, I'll turn it over to Al for to introduce tonight's speaker. Yeah, we would like to share one thing that we've gotten here. Okay, this is in El Salvador. Um, we have we found this huge grasshopper. I don't know if you can see it. Yeah, we can. It's a big one. Yeah. yeah. We've seen a few of them flying around now, and, including at the baseball stadium. And um, we also found this. I don't see if you can see the colors, but it's bright pink and green. Cool. Um, we Is it searched a moth? it up on Google and we couldn't find anything. Any Is it a moth? No, it's a butterfly. Okay. It's a oh, we'll get better pictures for next time. Thank you. Okay. Thanks for sharing. Yes, very cool. Thank you. Okay, well, I have the 
uh, pleasure of introducing our uh, speaker tonight. It's Dr. Akito Kawahara. He's the Associate Curator of Lepidoptera, uh, the McGuire Center for Lepidoptera and Biodiversity, uh, Florida Museum of Natural History in uh, Gainesville. And he um, has a BS from Cornell and his PhD from the University of Maryland with Charlie Mitter through the MIXI program, which most of us would be familiar with. He was an NSF postdoctoral fellow at the University of Hawaii or starting his position at the University of Florida. His research interests are insect evolution, predator-prey interactions, and genetics. He's published over 140 peer-reviewed scientific papers, especially on the evolution of butterflies and moths. He also conducts research on ultrasound production and hearing in moths and echolocation in bats. He's published numerous papers on the importance of insects as models for nature education, including a highly popular article on the action items that every individual can uh, do to help in global insect declines. He's appeared in numerous films and television shows, including PBS Nature, um, David Attenborough's Conquest of the Skies, and my favorite title, Beetle Queen Conquers Tokyo. And tonight is, uh, he'll be speaking to us about evolution and diversification of butterflies and moths, anti-bat ultrasound jamming, acoustic, acoustic deflection, and visual lures. Great. Thank you so much for the introduction. Um, I guess I could take it on from here. Is that right? Yeah, please do. Thanks. Okay. I'm going to share my screen. Oh, share sound. I think let me know if you can see this. It's loading right now. Everybody see this? Yes. OK, great. Um, so thank you for the introduction. This is great. Um, it's, really, it's really a pleasure to be here to um, give this talk in particular today, because um, you know, as a student at the University of Maryland many years ago, I remember coming to these uh, Entomological Society of Washington meetings and learning so much from all the amazing entomologists that uh, were there. And presented, and um, to be able to do this now uh, is is a true honor. So thank you very much for the invitation. Um, I also wanted to make this talk a little bit kind of with you know with Halloween coming up and things. I, I decided to make it a little bit more about bats and moths more than um, more than some of the other research that we were doing. Um, but I will talk about evolution of Lepidoptera and things like that. But I will kind of focus a, a chunk on um, uh, bat moth interactions because of sort of the the timing of the talk uh, in, in the fall now. So um, I'm at the University of Florida, uh, as introduced, um, and uh, I've been here for about 10 years. Um, and the, the presentation I'm going to give today really is, um, you know, a lot of work by a lot of people that have helped. And uh, it's mainly people in my lab who have just contributed in so many different ways. And uh, without their help, uh, none of this would have been possible. So I'm simply really standing here just kind of showing some of the main results and, and the um, conclusions of the studies that we have conducted. So just to give you a little talk outline, um, I wanted to start off by just talking a little bit about the McGuire Center. Um, it's a center in, you know, at the University of Florida in, in Gainesville. And uh, a lot of people don't know what the center really is about, I think. And I just wanted to kind of give an overview about what the center is and what it is about. Um, and, uh, and then I'm gonna move on to kind of go into the research portion of my presentation, which is the evolution of Lepidoptera. It's a huge group with 160,000 species or more. Um, and then talk about the moth anti-bat defense uh, section of my presentation. And then finally, I'm just gonna end with insect declines because I really think it's important. I know uh, Doug Ptolemy gave a talk recently here um, and I know others have uh, that, that have been doing this, but it's really, really important. And I think it's important to kind of uh, mention this again. So uh, just a little bit of overview about the, uh, about the McGuire Center. So it's in some ways analogous to the, I, I would say Cornell Lab uh, of Ornithology um, in Ithaca, New York, um, in the sense that it's an institution that's specifically devoted to the study of one group of organisms. And the group of organisms is butterflies and moths. And it's, uh, the center is located uh, as part of the Florida Museum of Natural History, which is a department at the University of Florida. It's a department and a college in the University of Florida. So we're actually on the campus and many of you might know this already, but uh, there's lots of students and, and volunteers and so forth that work in the, in the museum. Um, and the Novara Center again is one portion of that. And here in this picture is this butterfly rainforest. It's a big uh, enclosure where live butterflies and moths fly. 
And here, this is a picture during the day, and on the left is the large enclosure, and the collections and stuff are in the main building that's shown uh, straight ahead. Now, this um, center it was founded in 2006, so it's relatively new. It's only about 15 years old, um, and uh, the center includes um, some somewhere around 10 million specimens, maybe a little bit less than that, uh, and, and the rainforest that I mentioned. And it's all butterflies and moths, like I said. And it was. Um, it was put together actually by uh, somebody named Bill McGuire. Uh, he was a he's a very well uh, wealthy uh, gentleman who who did, uh, donated a chunk of money to to build the center uh, for uh, the study of of Lepidoptera. And he himself was a Lepidopterist when he was younger, and he was studying skipper butterflies. And he wanted his his specimens to go somewhere and also um, be uh, kept in in a really uh, good place. And and so he he donated millions of dollars to build the center. And Tom Emmel, the, the late Tom. Uh, Emil passed away a couple of years ago, uh, was the founding director, and he was the one who managed uh, the, the sort of the general upkeep in all the um, operations until, I mean, until his passing. And uh, in the center, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a department in the museum, in the university, so it's not enormous, it's not like a Smithsonian Museum or anything like that, but it definitely has uh, a lot going on. Uh, there's a, a wall of wings, it's a big wall of all these uh, insect images and pictures and uh, images and, and specimens, um, uh, Lepidoptera images and specimens. Um, there's obviously like kids areas, we call it the butterfly, or sorry, the discovery zone. Um, there's obviously the butterfly rainforest, which is the outdoor area where, where all kinds of butterflies and moths and also there's lots of birds in there also as well. Um, and then, you know, uh, areas where you can actually view the lab. So my lab actually is an in-view lab as well. Um, and a lot of museums have this now where you can actually see the scientists doing work. So our molecular lab is actually an in-view lab and, and uh, the public can, can view it from outside. And some of the projects that go on um, in different labs uh, include uh, conservation work. So here is a picture of um, the Tala butterfly and also the Shouse swallowtail. These are two endangered, federally endangered uh, butterflies uh, that are endemic to Florida. And uh, the cups on the left are rearing containers where there's um, researchers uh, rearing them, and these are reintroduced um, to the to the wild. And this, this work is being supported um, by. Uh, uh, Disney Foundation and, and other uh, local um, uh, funds, and also NSF and things like that. We also have like these these um, educational uh, conference rooms and things like this for kids, and um, of course a, a very large uh, lepidoptera collection. So I just wanted to give that because I think it's important to kind of you know know where people come from in terms of um, when they're giving presentations and so forth. So I just wanted to sort of include that so everybody kind of knows what the McGuire Center is to put it on the map. Um, and uh, so, so now I'm going to kind of shift to the research part of my talk, the talk, which is the evolution of Lepidoptera. And um, I wrote here 160,000 plus species. We don't know exactly how many species there are. There are so many uh, species out there. Um, that that um, in in the very introduction here, um, somebody was uh, showing a picture uh, a, a, a butterfly, and that's a, a hair streak. Um, but that's just an example like of some of the groups that, um, you know, there's lots of species still, even in butterflies that, that are not very well um, described. And um, so we're talking 160,000, but it's probably more like 500,000 or something like that, especially the microlepidoptera, the small moths. But I just wanted to say that, you know, butterflies and moths, especially moths, um, you know, are oftentimes perceived as kind of ugly insects. And I just want to, I mean, many of you here are entomologists already, so I don't, really have to say this, but I do really want to emphasize the fact that moths are not the typical brown noctuid moth that you see on your porch light. They're quite attractive. Like, look at this one here. This is a beautiful um, a moth with uh, black spots, orange body, blue eyes. Um, there's other kinds of moths that have really just spectacular shapes and patterns and things like that. And we always, you know, we always tend to think about the adults, but we have to not forget about the other stages, right? Like, the, the larvae, the eggs even, are really beautiful, um, and, and also uh, the pupil stages as well. And um, this is kind of a pretty introductory for this group, but um, this image here just shows you, there's 19 uh, lepidopterans shown here, and uh, all but five of them are moths. So, you know, what I'm trying to say here is that moths are also quite attractive, and it's not just the butterflies that are the beautiful, colorful uh, lepidopterans out there. Um, so when it comes to the evolution of Lepidoptera, surprisingly little has been done in terms of 
um, understanding the basic you know, evolutionary relationships. And my advisor, Charlie Mitter at University of Maryland, who was, was at University of Maryland before, um, he was really, uh, really focusing on this, this question. And after I got my job at the University of Florida, we started to work on this too. And um, so our first paper came out in 2014, um, where we, we kind of looked at the evolutionary relationships on a very kind of small scale. And then we kind of upped the, the sampling and we, we tried to get use a, a, an approach called anchored phy phylogenomics, which is a target capture approach. So you use many, many genes as opposed to just a few genes to try to build an evolutionary tree. Um, and and um, there've been other uh, studies that have come out from Europe and also from the United States, other groups in the United States, um, but we all still haven't been able to do a very good job, I'd say, until, um, I mean, I guess I don't want to promote my own research, but one of the things that we really uh, tried, no one has really tried to do very well, I'd say, until recently is, um, is uh, this, uh, you know, the evolutionary timing. So I'm getting an, a, a grasp of how you know, the butterflies in moss evolved over, over a particular amount of time. So here I include a, a QR code. I'm going to really kind of speed through this and I'm not going to talk about the details. And if anyone's interested in finding out the methods and stuff, you can, you can use the barcode on the screen to, to QR code on the screen to, to pull up the paper. Um, but uh, basically what we did for this study was it's, it's, a, it's a study that was um, using transcriptomics. So it, it requires the use of um, RNA. So in order to do this properly, we needed to really get good quality specimens. We can't really use like the DNA from the legs of specimens. We really needed fresh specimens. So we went out into the field and we looked for moths and butterflies kind of all over the world uh, for several years. And of course, things like spingids are, are really common and are, you know, they're, they're not as uh, phylogenetically maybe interesting, uh, but we also, we did include those uh, as well. And we go into the tropics and this is a video from, I think it's from Costa Rica or something. Um, and anyway, you know, the sheet gets full of bugs and we pick off the moths that, that we need and then we, we keep sequencing on those. Um, so here's a specimen that we took in the field and then we, we, we got the RNA from that and we built an evolutionary tree. And I'm not, again, I'm not gonna go into the details, but the results are basically um, something like this. So this is an evolutionary tree of butterflies and moss that we built um, based on 2098 uh, genes. Um, and, uh, and it's a representative uh, phylogeny, right? So it's not, you know, it's very difficult to get as lots and lots of species in big trees um, still and do a, a really kind of, uh, solid job of that. So what we did was we, we, we tried to get representatives from uh, all of the major super families and families and, and we built this evolutionary tree. And, um, and on the scale here on the, on the right is the number of million years ago. So the lepidopterans go back to about 300 million years, at least that's what we think now. Um, and uh, some of the uh, things that I just wanted to mention is uh, we did some, of course, uh, dating, and this tree is uh, dated in evolutionary uh, sense in terms of the number of million years. Um, and we did two analyses, one with 16 fossils. So uh, when we did this first analysis with 16 fossils, we, we reached out to the community, asked uh, uh, you know, people like Conrad Lavendera and, and others, Don Davis and others at Smithsonian, uh, to, to assess the fossils that we, we were going to include. And um, we came up with these 16 that the community of lepidopterists felt was really uh, a good a number and you know they're, they're solid fossils and then we also uh, did an analysis of just three fossils and these are fossils in which you can actually see the characteristic that is present in that particular group um, in the fossil so we were almost certain that they belonged at the particular place in the tree and then we ran the analysis and the results were relatively comparable so i'm only going to show one of the results but that's what we found here and the what's neat about lipidopterans is like the the origin the the, the really deep groups or the the most um, you know, the first lineages that kind of branched off are have mandibles. So most people think of butterflies and moths as having just a proboscis, but the proboscis is not in every butterfly and moth group, right? There's a few that have man mandibles, just like trichopterans or, or the caddisflies. And then um, another thing we, we did was um, we, we compared it with the taxonomy and the classification, and we found that many of the different groups are, um, that, that have been recognized are still uh, good groups for monophyletic. And, the, and I didn't mention this before, but the red dots here indicate the groups that are well supported or have very uh, strong uh, con conclusive results, whereas some of the colored uh, non-red dots um, are, are those that are, might be not as strong. Um, but one group I wanted to mention is the angiospermivora on the bottom there. This is a clade that predominantly, a group that predominantly feeds on angiosperms. And that's gonna be important in, in is what I'm gonna talk about uh, in a few minutes. Um, so, but one thing that we discovered too, um, and this, this follows uh, results from before, but butterflies are not related to the larger moths and they're, they're clearly separated from each other. And they, these major, major groups with 
you know, hundreds of thousands or tens of thousands of species are um, uh, kind of evolved around um, 100 million years ago, so is our estimate now. So um, something that is um, of personal interest, I'm going to talk about this later a little bit more in detail, is moth ears and hearing. And so a lot of moths, about 80,000 or more species of moths have these hearing organs on different parts of the body. And one of the things that I've always wanted to know is, you know, these hearing organs that are found in all these different families of moths, and they supposedly evolve independently across lepidopterans, and they're all ultrasonic, supposedly. Um, how did they evolve and when did they evolve? And, and the, the reason why these moths have these hearing organs um, has to do with their predators. And again, I'll go into this in detail, but the, one of the major predators that these moths have to encounter is, uh, is bats. So when the moth is flying at night, they're flying around and they, they, get, you know, they, they get captured by moths, and, uh, excuse me, by bats. And um, these bats consume you know, nearly half of their body weight can, uh, in a single night, and they can eat that much. Um, so th this predator is extremely important in, in um, uh, in moth evolution, and these hearing organs seemingly evolved against them. And that's the hypothesis that we have been working with. And everybody's thought that hearing organs were evolved in, in the evolution of Lepidoptera uh, after bats evolved. So we tested this. So this round tree, the semicircle tree on the top here, is the same tree that I just showed before, same evolutionary tree, but kind of turned into a half a, sem you know, half a circle. And what you see is are the little, little red dots, and the red dots indicate the origin of those hearing organs, at least you know, five or six of them in, on this tree. And what you see is the origin of bats uh, at 65 million years ago is um, after the origin of some of these major uh, groups of lepidopterans that have hearing organs. So that was really surprising because people had really, really thought that hearing organs in, but, uh, in moths came out after the origin of bats, and that doesn't seem to be the case. And what we think now is that it's probably that these hearing organs were there for some other function, perhaps to hear other kinds of predators, like the footsteps of um, rodents and things or, and other organisms, or maybe even for mating, because lots of moths use um, ultrasound for mating. We also looked at uh, angiosperms and how the evolution of Lepidoptera relates to the evolution of angiosperms. And here's just a representative angiosperm phylogeny from one of the studies that was done before, but it overall kind of like overlaps pretty well with, with the timing of angiosperm evolution. And we really wanted to test this a little bit more rigorously. So we looked at, uh, I'm not gonna get into too much of details here, but we looked at seven different studies and that's, these are these bars across the, uh, across um, this, this uh, evolutionary time scale. And um, the, what, what's in the purple here is the angiosperm uh, feeding clade credibility interval. And it's this, it's this area where uh, the, it's the origin of angiosperm feeding in butter, butterflies and moths. And it overlaps pretty nicely with many of these different studies for the origin of angiosperms from the angiosperm studies. So that was really um, good to know and, and sort of confirmed our, our findings. And uh, we also have a, an, an A here, we have a, this is a fossil um, uh, uh, pollen grain. I'm sorry. And here we go, we have, uh, next is this uh, fossil uh, scale of a lepidopteran um, that comes you know, after that, which is just sort of fits the story. And then the third one here is, um, a fossil bat, and that comes much sooner. So this, the, the fossils and the fossil record also follow the same um, pattern. So we have some, some evidence that suggests that this is really what happened. I'm not gonna go into this too much, but with this evolutionary tree, you can do all kinds of really cool things. And what we're doing in my lab right now is looking at the evolution of color, like wing color, and a bunch of students and postdocs and stuff working on this. Um, and then wing pattern and shapes, like butterflies and moths, and incredible wing patterns and, and shapes and things like that. And we have um, one of my uh, uh, colleagues just submitted a pretty big NSF grant looking at the evolution of silks and how silks are made in, in butterflies and moths, like the genetics of silks and also, you know, the structure and, and the function of silks. And then we can also look at like uh, the genes. You know, one of the things I'm interested in now is how do butterflies and moths see and what's going on inside their eyes and, you know, are, what's the genetics of, of vision in, in moths and butterflies and acoustics as well. How do moths actually hear and is, are there genes that are associated with um, hearing these bats? And also things like olfaction, right? Moths and butterflies, really important to f for finding, uh, they have incredible antennae for finding um, flowers and, and, their, and their, um, also their mates and so forth. So those are kind of the areas of the research in my lab. And I'm just gonna highlight a few of these. So one of the grad students that's, that's wrapping up his PhD right now is working on the evolution of color. 
So using that evolutionary tree that I showed earlier, he has built his own evolutionary tree of underwing moths or catacala. Many of you may know Katakala. Um, it's a really beautiful group of moths, and they have these hind wings that are colorful. And what's really interesting is these moths, um, their behavior is to show their hind wings and sort of display them um, as a, a visual a display against predators to supposedly scare them. But what's really interesting about them um, is that when you look at the, the distribution of these color, different types of um, uh, Katakala moths, in any given place, there's seemingly multiple different sizes and multiple different colors of these hind wings. So they don't seem to have converged onto the same color, but they've evolved into these different colors types. And it appears to be um, a, a defense against predators. So he was trying to understand is predator avoidance driving the color pattern under the moss, and it appears that that might be the case. And if you have any questions about this, I can tell you more about it. And our digitization manager, Laurel Kaminsky, was the one who took thousands and thousands of images. And here's an example of why digitizing natural history collections is important, because that was used to characterize the wing colors and, and estimate you know, how different the colors are on each of these different moth species. Um, and then in terms of the genes and stuff we're, that we're doing in, in my group, uh, my research group, was we're looking at, um, I have a student that's looking at a, a evolution of, of color uh, vision genes in, in butterflies and moths. Um, and he's found there's all these gene duplications, really cool stuff happening, in, especially in butterflies. Butterflies are really interesting because they're diurnal. Um, but one of the fundamental questions is we still didn't have a very good idea of flight activity and how flight activity, meaning you know whether diurnal or nocturnal, how that's actually evolved in, in the Lepidoptera. So what we did to, to solve that problem was we did a lab project where we went for three days, we went, so I'm in Florida, so we, we decided, okay, let's let's go to the beach. And this is pre-COVID, by the way. We didn't do this, you know, during COVID or anything like that. Um, but pre-COVID, we went to the we rented an Airbnb, and a bunch of us got together and we said, all right, let's let's write this paper. For three days, we sat there with our laptops. We all worked together on the Google Docs, and we wrote a paper. I, I cannot believe we did this. We wrote a paper in three days. We submitted it on the third day, and we we, we published it. But what what the point was was to understand the evolution of deal. Or, or day night activity in butterflies and moths. And this is an evolutionary tree again on the left here. And we wanted to know what was the ancestor? Was it diurnal or was it nocturnal? And the evidence suggests that it was probably a diurnal or day flying moth that was the ancestor of, of butterflies and moths. And then we had these nocturnal uh, groups that sort of just all evolved um, afterwards. But there were shifts back to uh, flying during the day again, like in the, in the butterflies and then a few other groups. So we got this information that was really important, but we still don't know much about lepidopteran activity times. You know, we know maybe butterflies fly during the day and moths, many moths fly during at night, the night. But we can't forget that the night, the night is really complex, right? Not all moths, and, and this applies to all insects really, um, fly all the time during the night. There are different times when the moth flies, you know, or maybe the males fly at a, earlier in the evening and maybe later in the evening the females fly. But we don't have like any data on this. So my student and, and I, we built this, um, our, um, this uh, Raspberry Pi device. It's a basically a you know, mesh insect cage and you collect bugs and you throw them in there. And then the bug starts to move around and it detects when the, the bug is moving. And on the right here is the actual um, curve. So here you can see like this activity right here uh, in the night. Um, and this is the daytime. There's no activity of this particular moth and there's a lot of activity um, here at the very beginning of the night. So this is the early night and this is towards the end of the night. And we can start to compile these things. And this is what we're trying to do is to do this for as many insects as we can. So we can build these a database of behavior. When are these moths active? And when are, you know, what are they doing? And the idea is to link it to, what my interest is really to link it to bats because I have this hypothesis, I have this idea that I really want to test, which is that moths that have some defenses against these bats, I think are flying, you know, probably around times when bats are active. And those that don't have defenses might be flying, you know, to avoid the bats. So bats in this graph, you can see, oftentimes in the pink uh, graph, uh, oftentimes are active at the very beginning of the night and at the very end of the night. But there's this gap in the middle where there's bats are not that active. So lots of moths, I think, are active during that time, but we don't actually know that. So that's what we're trying to test. Um, so that this discussion leads into this moth and anti-bat defense section that I wanted to talk about. And this is um, a work that I'm doing with, with a collaborator of mine, Jesse Barber at Boise State University. We received a bunch of funding for this, and it's really interesting. And, and I'm really, you know, we've written these proposals multiple times and got denied, but finally we got our second grant. Um, and uh, we're really interested in sound production and sonar deflection. And the sound production work was really um, this uh, stuff that I'll talk about in a minute, but it's on off moths. And then um, this, the deflection stuff is on these other moths that are 
So here again, I'm just showing you some videos of, of bats and moths interacting. But what's important to remember again is that moths are flying at night and there's lots of bats, and the bats are eating them all the time. And the moths have to figure out ways to escape. Um, and this pressure is very significant. As I mean. And so just this is, you know, moth bat interactions one of class, you know, 101. Um, but here we have a bat that's a predator and it uses its sonar and then it hits a flying object like a flying moth or something or a flying beetle or whatever it is. Um, and then the bouncing echo returns to the, to the bat and the bat is able to locate where that moth is. And so this is how it basically works, right? Um, and uh, so, so again, I, and oh yeah, and also the, oh, there's these, all this is happening at high frequency. So human beings cannot hear it, but if you use a bat detector and go outside in the middle of the night, even in, in the city, um, you know, just outskirts of Washington, you'll, you'll hear bats out there and bugs too that you can't hear with your naked, um, you know, just with, with our hearing. Um, and I showed this uh, earlier before, but lots of different moths have hearing organs, right? So um, we wanted to really understand this um, in, in the context of, of uh, hawk moths. And what we did was, um, we knew that many hawk moths have hearing organs. So they have um, an ear, right? But it's not on the thorax, it's actually on the mouth parts in these guys. And we wanted to know if hawk moths produce ultrasound against bat attack. If you caught a hawk moth and you played it a bat attack call, does it actually respond and what is it actually doing? So we tested this. So we caught a bunch of hawk moths and we, we, you, we actually put them in front of the cage and we, and we filmed this. Um, where we played ultrasound of these bad attack calls to see what the moths do. And this is a zoom up of the, the genitals. This is the male genitalia of this hawk moth. And what you'll see is these valves stridulate. This is slowed down, but basically what's happening is the, the genital valves are moving back and forth and it creates ultrasound. And this is what they do in response to bats. So when they hear the bat sound, that's what they do. Oh yeah, and this is this stuff like, yeah, created a lot of sort of interesting articles and the public uh, websites came up like the second one, kinky hawk moths rub genitals toward up bats, sonic genitals, a bizarre defense in the moth bat war. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's great to see um, insects be publicized, um, but sometimes it, maybe it's a little bit too much. Um, but I guess, uh, so now going to the question of why did these hawk moths make sounds? You know, they're making noise. When you play a bat call at a moth or at the hawk moth, it responds. They make noise using the genitals, so why? So we wanted to test this and what we did was we did this in um, a lab. So this is in Jesse Barber's lab at Boise State University. You'll see a hawk moth in the middle, that's that dot. And you'll see in this video, this bat will swoop up to this area um, where the moth is. And then it doesn't catch it and the moth in the bottom, sorry, the, the bat flies away. So if we uh, play this back um, at a very slow motion, uh, what you see is the bat is coming up from below and it's going up towards the moth. And what you see on the bottom too is the recording of the, the echolocation call. So you see all these pings here, and then this sudden wall of noise that is created. And this is the hawk moth using its genitals to make an extremely loud noise, and then the bat fails to catch the, the moth. And so what's happening here, and we did this with many trials, but that wall of noise that the hawk moth is creating is essentially an obstruction. The, the bat can't locate the precise location of the moth because the wall of noise is so loud and the moth is producing the noise in response to the echo. So the returning echo is, cannot be detected because there's too much noise. And that's how they seem to escape. So that's why they make this ultrasound. And, the, and I, as I mentioned, hawk moth genitals are doing this. And here's a, a bunch of different species of hawk moth genitalia, laterally, uh, lateral views. And you can see these scales are just super modified and weird, right? On the left, we, I, what I have is this, on the upper left is this uh, slide that says no organ or a picture that says no organ. That doesn't have anything, but these other ones are modified into some really bizarre um, uh, scales and they, they rub them with the genitals. So as we were doing this hawk moth work, we also were, you know, just interested. We were in the field and bugs were coming to the, you know, to the mercury vapor light. So we were just collecting them and we were watching what these moths were doing. And we did this with other insects too, by the way. And we placed these moths in front of the, the speaker and the microphone and we would play back the, the bad attack call and we just record this over and over again with every, any moth that we can actually test this with. And this was kind of a side project at first, but it sort of ballooned into something much bigger. And what we discovered was that it's, it's amazing. Lots of different kinds of moths produce ultrasound. And here in the screen, what you just saw was there's little pings across the white screen. And what that is, is the, the, the sounds of the moths um, making noise against the bat. 
And um, so we found out that pyralid moths make anti-bat sounds. So here's a species called Metonia hansoni from Africa, and they have the structure, it's a, it's a tegula that seems to be stridulating um, and producing ultrasound. Uh, Lymantriite moths, um, you know, the typical moths that you oftentimes see in, you know, in your yard and stuff, um, they have on the sixth abdominal segment a structure that uh, seemingly, um, or it, it's not seemingly, it definitely does, um, make large noise uh, when, you, um, when you play back bat attack. Um, and this produces ultrasound and they're like jets that point backwards towards the abdomen of the moth. So we did this over and over with all these different groups. And we have, you know, we, we discovered that there are many different kinds of ways that moths produce ultrasound. And, and, those, and the types of uh, calls are really, really interesting too. And there's lots of different kinds of moths that do it. It's not just hawk moths. It's not just also tiger moths, which I'll talk about in a second, um, which, which is the main group that has been studied. But it's really, really complicated and it's really, really interesting. So here what we, we have is um, just, this is just a slide of what we think are acoustic mimicry rings. And this is really not very well studied and, and it's my like, I'm very interested in this. Um, but anyway, what, what Jesse and, and his lab and, and, and what we've been working on is um, looking at uh, these different sound calls and then clustering them on the left, uh, in, the, in the diagram on the left over here. And what you see is you see these kind of clusters of, of little uh, groups and they're unrelated moth groups, right? So these are all different kind of subfamilies and families and stuff. And what you see is, um, Sorry, I should go back. Um, they cluster into different uh, uh, little clusters, and there's one over here. And we wanted to know: are are these palatable? Maybe these are acoustic mimicry rings, and there's a there's a model like you know a monarch type of thing in one of these groups that is toxic, and maybe that's why everybody wants to sound like a particular moth. So we actually tested this. So we wanted to know: are moths that make sounds edible to bats? A very simple question. So we, well, while we were in the field, we would catch the bats too, and we had to go through like Jesse's group did all the high cook work and everything. But anyway, we we would ca catch the moths and we would feed them to the bats and see what they would do. So here's a moth that is very palatable, very tasty. This one, however, um, you can see this bat just does not want to eat this moth. It shakes its head and says, "No way, this is really gross. I do not want to eat this moth." So we we figured out, okay, there's lots of uh, toxic moths in this in this group of moths that make sounds. And so the little red dots here indicate those that are toxic, and these are unpalatable mimicry rings. They're Mullerian mimicry rings, apparently. What, what appeared in, in the Mullerian mimicry rings. And then here we have a, a, a palatable moth mimicry ring. Uh, I think there's probably, you know, there's only 13, uh, 33 species that, in, from one location in Ecuador that we tested over one visit. Um, my guess is there's a model in there that we just don't know. Um, so what, what this is seemingly um, telling us is that there is, you know, these unrelated species are converging onto these acoustic mimicry rings, and there's possible malarian and basically a base Batesian uh, acoustic uh, mimics and mimicry rings occurring. And I think this is so cool. Like this is, you know, I, I like, you know, Heliconius, I like, you know, monarch butterflies, but moths are, are like, oh my God, they're so much cooler, I think. Um, and nothing is really known about this. So here's an example of acoustic aposematism. So here's a, a toxic moth, okay, um, that, um, uh, is, is uh, toxic and it displays. So what they do is they make the sounds and they tell the bat that they're chemically defended. And this is what happens. The moth is making sounds here at the bat. And the bat comes up to the moth and decides not to eat it. So this shows that the bats are learning that moths that produce certain types of sounds are inevitable, inedible, and not take good tasting. And that's why we think these all these moths have converged onto these different types of calls and, and are talking to bats in many different ways. So um, the last kind of section I wanted to kind of quickly talk about is um, the, the these Saturnian moths, right? These are wild silk moths of Saturnians. The really interesting about this moth group is that they have no ears, no sound. They don't even produce sounds. You know, they don't have any toxins, supposedly. Some, some toxa do, but most of them don't. Um, and they don't even have mouth parts. So these guys have nothing except big body size. So what is their defense? When, you know, what, what is, how do they defend themselves against bats? So I'm going to talk about sonar deflection now, which I think is really interesting, um, something that we discovered uh, fairly recently. And this, this whole story kind of begins back in Borneo in 2014. 
So one of my uh, graduate students at the time and, and a bunch of us went into the field and we set up a, a mercury vapor light and, and this moth uh, uh, came to the light or one of these uh, moon moths relatively came to the light. And anyway, it, it came to light and we all looked at it and thought, wow, this is a beautiful moth, you know? And the students said, you know, why, why does this moth have tails? And none of us actually knew. So um, we thought, well, I no idea. So we, um, we started to think about, you know, why do butterflies have tails? And a lot of really cool work has been done on this already. But um, in terms of butterflies, they have, a lot of them have a false head, right? So um, it, what, what's going on here is there's a, this is a, a, a butterfly in which the, the tail end or the back end looks like sort of like a head where you have here, this is the eye right here, and these are the antennae, these are the front legs, and these are like the second legs. And this area is red, so it kind of attracts visual predators, and all the lines are fo focused on this area. So what happens is the butterfly rests, and then it wiggles its, its tails, um, and then um, pet predators like birds or lizards or whatever, spiders, bite the back of the, uh, the butterfly, and then the, the butterfly flies away and escapes. So that's the idea with, with uh, butterfly tails. But luna moths and these other kind of long-tailed moths, they don't really have that going on for them, right? They have these eye spots, but the rest of the, the, the moth is just a uniform color. So what is their defense? We really wanted to figure this out. And so we got kind of um, uh, created. And what we, or what we first did was we started to just fly, we reared a bunch of these luna moths and, and we just watched them fly. And what we, what we found what was really interesting is that the tails actually spin. So the tails, if you look at, this is from the side, this is a side view, but if you look at it from the back, the tails are going around in a circle like a fan. So we're like, whoa, this is really, really interesting. Um, and uh, so yeah, the tails spin like a fan and we wanted to know, okay, what is going on here? So maybe, you know, when we look at it, uh, it looks like a sp fan spinning, but what does a you know, predator like a bat see when they see a moth, you know, or they, they hear a moth uh, flying? So uh, a luna moth like this. So here we have the tail and the hind wing forming and imagine, this a moth like this in this ori orientation, um, and what was done was um, the the moth was placed uh, in a in an acoustic echolocation uh, chamber. So a chamber was built specifically to understand how the moth flies. And so here is the tail. Imagine the tail here and the hind wing and the forewing here. And when you play this, this is kind of what it looks like. So the red areas are the areas where there's most of the echoes are kind of coming off of the moth as it's moving around. So what you see is that the forewing, the hind wing, and the tail are all kind of important, but the tail actually has a really, really high amount of echoes coming off of this, this portion. So then once we found that, we're like, whoa, this is really cool. Maybe the tails of these moths are deflecting the bat echoes away from the main body, and that's maybe an anti-bat strategy. So what we did was we did this experiment where we, we put these moths um, and we pitted them against bats. So these are luna moths in the lab that are flying around um, and uh, some of them have tails and some of them don't have tails. So this is what happens when the moth has tail, the tails. The bat comes up, rips the tail off and doesn't seem to get grab the body and the, the, the moth escapes. So if you look at this statistically, this is kind of what this looks like. Um, but you have uh, about, so if you present uh, moths with tails, they're only eaten about 30% of the time by bats. That's on the bottom here. And the image on the top is when you present a, a moth that has removed its, had its tails removed already, and then you present it to a bat, it gets eaten about 80% of the time. So these tails are clearly defensive strategies against predators like bats that use sonar. So one of my students is really taking this to the next level, and she's, she's been using museum specimens. So again, she's, she's using these digitized images and trying to characterize the tails across all these Saturnian moths. And um, what's really interesting is that there are definitely evolutionary transitions or, or, or um, sort of uh, shifts to longer tails, which also you know, supports the idea that over time, there's more selection towards longer and longer tails. And she also did this experiment where she extended the tails of, of some of these moths. And, and again, we saw a much higher um, uh, survival rate when the tails were longer. Oops, sorry. Um, and now what we're doing, oops, this is another video I want to show you real quick. Um, now we're looking at moths as they fly and the aerodynamics of flight. So we're working with some physics researchers, looking at how the moths move their wings and what actually happens to the tails and how much of the wing can actually be removed and how much is it actually useful for, for predators like that. So that's kind of the next step that we're working on right now. There's a really cool paper that came out last year, I think it was last year, um, by Tom Neal and others. Um, and they discovered, uh, based on the, 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 spe the, the species that they studied, that um, moth's hairiness, right, the, the scales on the wings and, and the body are not probably there for just for uh, thermal regulation, like keeping temperature high for the moth, but actually it absorbs sonar. So when bats 
uh, you know, when the sonar hits a furry moth, it gets absorbed. It's kind of like absorbed. It's kind of like an invisibility cloak, you know, in Harry Potter. So the moth becomes invisible against the pack. So we think that maybe those those hairy moths have evolved in that way to uh, go against predators like bats. So now I'm going to, um, this is my very, very last part, which is the insect declines. And so why does this kind of like all matter? Why am I going to say, talk about this? Well, I wanted to say this because I know many of you already know this, but it is really important. I'm just going to kind of emphasize this. So there was an article that came out in New York Times Magazine several years ago talking about the insect apocalypse. It gained a lot of publicity. It's been over, it's actually more than 150 papers now on this topic about how insects are disappearing and there's been reviews and Lots of research on fireflies and, and moths and butterflies and all kinds of beetles, everything, bees, you know. Um, and I, I really like to show this picture because I think it is really telling. This is Jansen, Dan Jansen's paper in um, uh, in PNAS this earlier this year, where he showed a picture of um, a moth sheet or an insect sheet in 1984 versus 2019, um, roughly the same time, same place, same lights, and the, the setup is very different. And, and we do see this kind of as many of us know all over kind of the world. And so why does this really matter? And um, so this is the kind of the opinion piece, this thing that I'm going to uh, talk about. Um, but uh, it's, of course, you know, this is, I think, something that all of us should know. Um, when you're in, you know, on an airplane or wherever, I mean, I guess right now, not many of us are traveling, maybe still. Um, but if you are, um, if you have the opportunity to tell people and somebody asks you, why are you an entomologist? I would say you should memorize this. You know, insects provide $75 billion a year for the US economy. This is pretty well known. Um, they are extremely important. Obviously, vegetables, fruit, coffee, even is, you know, chocolate, like all these things are insect uh, pollinated. Silk dyes, honey, a lot of robots that are being designed are designed off of insects. Um, and even the coronavirus vaccine, some people don't realize that uh, a moth is used to, to um, as one of the, um, the proteins from one of the moths is used as a, um, one of the steps for building the, uh, the vaccine. Um, and uh, insects benefit us in, in many different ways, and I always refer to the five Ps, and this is in that paper that I just mentioned, um, but uh, they're, they're pollinators, they're prey, they're physical de decomposers, they help progress in science and technology, and, uh, and what I think is also a very important one is provide pleasure. If you stop and you look at moths and insects in general, they're just really beautiful and they're amazing, right, and they provide pleasure. And then when you think about these kinds of numbers, and this number you know, has been debated in the literature, but if really 40% of all the world's insects are going to go to skin extinct in the next few de decades, we have a really serious problem, right? And, and um, what I just kind of mentioned is in this particular article that came out earlier this year, um, but there are, you know, eight action items that I think are really important. And I just kind of wanted to just mention those here. You know, we want to create insect-friendly uh, habitats, convert lawns into, lawns into diverse natural habitats. The Doug Talman talks about this all the time, but I really think it's important and we all should be doing it. Let's, let's not forget, you know, let's not just put it aside, like let's do it. You know, I just converted my backyard into a natural habitat. I stopped mowing it, you know, and, and things like growing natural uh, native plants, reducing pesticides. It's a pretty, pretty basic things, but we really should do them. Remove or limit the use of uh, ex uh, exterior lighting, um, this is also an important one, uh, removing or lessening the soap, uh, soaps from washing your vehicles and washing um, buildings and stuff. You, you, this should not be done. We should use uh, alternative soaps, which are available, which I talked about in the paper. Um, and also this is about ed education, but increasing awareness, right? Like we need to stop the negative perceptions of insects, like names like the murder hornet are really not good for <laughs> insects in general. Um, and, um, and, you know, I think all of us know something a lot about insects and we can become educators and advocates for conservation, both at local and larger scales. And, um, and I, I'd say, you know, you just have to just start somewhere, like start with your uh, children or your grandchildren. Um, and then finally, you know, getting involved in local politics, supporting scientists and, and science and also voting. And I just want to say by, you know, as, as somebody who has my you know, kids now, um, I really, really think it's important to really help kids love insects. And it really doesn't require that much time. All you have to do is go out there and show them the natural world because there's still a lot out there and all the things about, you know, moss and ultrasound and all this kind of stuff wouldn't have happened for me if it wasn't for my father, who was the one who, who um, took me outside and showed me the world out there. So I hope that all of us can do that. Um, so with that, I'd like to just end and just thank uh, the various different uh, uh, resources and funding sources and stuff that, that supported this talk that I gave today. Um, and I guess with that, I, I might have gone over. I'm sorry if I went too far over. Oh, it's exactly eight o'clock. Amazing.
It's never happened before. Um, I guess I could take uh, questions now. And sorry again if I went a little bit fast. Now that was great. I think we could have listened to you for a lot longer. Oh, really? I took out like, I thought I was going to go way over. So I took out like 20 slides like an hour ago. <laughs> yeah, I just wanted to let you know you had, uh, we had 58 Zoom uh, connections for this. And I know some of those had multiple people at them. So we had a very nice turnout of, for the audience. Cool. Um, yeah, I can start by asking you a, a question. Um, sure. The whole talk was really fascinating, but um, you know, there used to be this creationist um, argument against evolution that you know, like the eye was too perfect an organ to you know, just have evolved de novo. And um, I was just worrying about all these you know, tympanal organs and all these different maws and all these stridulatory organism, uh, uh, organs. Like, have you thought like what the precursors for some of these things might have been, might have been like, how did they possibly evolve? Yeah, so um, it's a very good question. I mean, I, I think, you know, for the genital stridulatory organs, like the ones that these hawk moths have where they stridulate their genitalia, um, I think, yeah, it was used primarily for mating, but because of bats or whatever that took off, um, you know, or whatever the other predators might have been around, they, they switched, you know, the use got sort of, there's another new function associated with that structure. Um, but I really think, you know, I mean, this again is just Lepidopterans I'm speaking from, um, but I, I think, you know, I think about beetles a lot lately and I think about flies and stuff and, you know, it makes me think that they're probably doing similar things, right? They're nocturnal flies, there's obviously nocturnal beetles and stuff, and, um, you know, they must be dealing with this somehow as well. Like scarab beetles, for example, they're super slow flyers, like, so what is their defense? Like, and we find scarabs in, in bat poop, so they're getting eaten to some degree. Um, so stuff like that, just, I just think about this a lot. I think it's um, really interesting, but there's definitely precursorial uh, functions that existed that I think were shifted around, you know, 60 million years ago or so when bats started to kind of really take off. So there was uh, one question in the chat from, uh, from Danny, it says, in your experiments, does sound production by the moths occur only in response recordings of a feeding buzz, or will they respond to signals, or sorry, will they respond to recordings of earlier signals? And then if the latter, are there different species specific reactions to CF or FM signals? Oh, wow. Okay, very, very specific question. Um, am I still screen sharing? I can't tell. Uh, I'm not okay. Okay, I don't cool. think so. Um, so, uh, so yes. Yeah, so bats um, have two different types of calls. They have, or there's actually two general types of calls: CF and FM bat calls. Um, so the, these, the the research that was done um, in these different places uh, used uh, three different calls, actually four different calls: CF, FM, and kind of a combination of both, and also a synthetic uh, call. And uh, surprisingly, what we found was that these moths produce. Uh, ultrasound in response to pretty much any of them. And what's interesting is that CF and FM bat bats are pretty much split into old world and new world uh, groups, um, but we didn't see that kind of sensitivity. So moths, at least as far as we know, seem to be just responding to the presence of ultrasonic calls, and that's just it. They, they don't really seem to decipher anything more specific than that. That might not be true. I mean, there might be more and more different groups that we haven't studied that, that um, are responding to a much more select, you know, specific call type and things like that, but that doesn't seem to be the case. I don't know if that answers the question, but um, yeah. Are there any other questions? There's a bunch of hands up. I don't know if I'm supposed oh. to. Yeah, I don't know. I guess you I think can... you can unmute yourselves, right? If, if they want to ask. Do, do I just call on somebody? Or yeah, I guess if you see a hand up, maybe uh, okay, I'm just just gonna call go that person's over. name and ask them to unmute. Sure, uh, Jill. Thank you. I wasn't first in line. I was going to say let oh, free go, but that's okay. Okay. I um, noticed that you mentioned the importance of reducing runoff of soap from washing vehicles, 
And can you please talk more about that? You know, what specific impacts of yeah. soap runoff on moths? Because I yeah. haven't heard that too much. I know. Yeah, so I didn't really talk about that. I mean, this is kind of like tacked on at the very end, but I do think it's really important. So I, I shared that stuff with you. Um, but in the paper, we talk about specifically, you know, what kind of um, chemicals are in the soaps and things like this. But what the, the, you know, the bottom line is basically when you wash your car and you use the sort of the typical synthetic soaps that exist in, you know, um, in places like Home Depot or wherever, like auto, like, um, advanced auto parts or whatever, that, those kinds of places. Um, the soaps uh, contain toxins that uh, do not uh, degrade very quickly and they end up running, you know, basically they just go into the soils. And then there's been a lot of different studies that have shown the impact on aquatic insects. So it's not really lepidopterans in particular, but it's more the, the rivers and the streams nearby. When these um, compounds end up going into them, they, they really make a devastating impact on the aquatic insects. So it's an aquatic insect problem. Uh, Ani. Hi, Akito. Hi, how are you? It's good to see you. Good. Um, I'm around. <laughs> uh, I have two questions. The, uh, the first one is, well, like in butterflies, we have the ice spots, but we also have um, the butterflies that look like the trees or the, the dry leaves. Um, do you see something similar with the acoustic mimicries? Like the first videos that you show was like this really wall of noise that would look like, I don't know, like an analogous to the ice pots or something like that. Yeah, um, so that's, a, that's a really interesting question. So um, I think, you know, so the, the moths in general that are nocturnal are, you know, they, they, they're, a lot of them, you know, it's not, not a lot of visual cues are being used, right? So it's all pretty much auditory, right? So um, what seems to be happening is we don't really see kind of like anything analogous to like an eye spot, but the jamming signal, for example, is a long wall of noise, a very, very consistent amount of large noise um, that you see in tiger moss, you see it in hawk moss, we've seen it in some other groups too, um, but but that's very characteristic, right? So it's, it's the characteristic of um, basically preventing the the bouncing echo from the moth or the insect back to the bat, which is, you know, absorbed. It's just like, they just make a very large noise, right? And then a noise. Um, and others are more specific, like warning calls are very, very distinctive. So tiger moths make these very, very unique calls that they can do because they have these timbles, these structures on the thorax that allow them to produce these sounds that are very unique. And those sounds are warning to bats. And we know that already. Um, so different kinds of moths seem to be evolving to produce those types of unique calls so they can benefit as Batesian mimics in the system. At least that's what it seems like right now. Thank you. Uh, and the second, the second question will be, so what about the swallowtails? Ah, so swallowtails, this is a good question. Swallowtails also have tails, right? And their visual, um, uh, the, their defense is, you know, kind of like the Lysenid butterfly that I showed. Um, typically, it's also, the, they have the red eye spots oftentimes on the hind wings uh, near the, near the um, tails. And um, so at least from what we can tell, that's also a visual lure. So it's a visual lure for birds and other predators to attack that side of the body as opposed to the head. Thank you. Any other questions? I could ask one more. Um, sure, yeah, yeah. Akito, um, you mentioned uh, Tom Immel in your yeah. introduction. And uh, mm -hmm. I, I had a chance to interact with him a little bit. And he seemed like a real, you know, mover and, and shaker. And it's, you know, too bad he passed away. I, I think, didn't he pass away on a trip somewhere? And uh, yeah, so it was very unfortunate. It was very sudden. Nobody really expected it at all. He was on a trip to, I think it was Brazil. Um, and uh, yeah, he just passed away in his sleep. And um, I was just curious how you guys are you know, making out with fundraising and things like that. Is that yeah, so the impact? museum has taken over and, and it's like, you know, we're doing as much as we can. And, uh, you know, there's a big Lepidopter community. There's a lot of butterfly people uh, out there. Um, so it's still continuing um, and, you know, it's unfortunate that Don passed away, of course. But we have new leadership um, that's stepping in and stuff like that. And the director has changed. Keith Wilmot's lost the director now. And uh, I think in 2023, I'm gonna move into that position. So I think, I don't know, I think there's 
has changed, I guess, and it's not necessarily maybe bad. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Well, there's another hand raised there. Okay, uh, Koya, Sunni. Uh, I it's actually Manami, but um. Oh, sorry. And it, but that's okay. It's I'm I'm listening in with my um, son here. But um, when you said you know you clipped the tail of the moth, um, and that actually made them more susceptible to being caught. But does the cutting of the tail alter the flight pattern of the moth at oh. all to make them more susceptible Excellent to being? Excellent question. Excellent question. Um, the answer is not really, actually. Um, so there was a study that was done uh, many years ago in which somebody uh, took these moths and they are different kinds of, I think it was like cecropia moths or something, and they, they just wanted to see how it, the, the loss of wings would actually affect their flight. Mm -hmm. So they like cut different parts, it's pretty terrible what they did, but they anyway, they cut different parts of the wings off and they, they filmed like the, the flight movements of these moths. Mm -hmm. um, but you can remove large chunks of the hind wing, almost all of the hind wing, and the moth still can fly relatively well. However, if you do the same thing to the forewing, especially the leading portion of the forewing, which is the front vein area, the moth and the butterfly cannot fly almost at all. So there's certain parts of the wings that are more important than others. And the hind wing is seemingly not as important as the forewing. And especially the, the tail end or the, the back end of the, of the hind wing is, is, is not you know, as expendable. And that's why I think these moths have evolved these tails and other kinds of things going on there. Some of them have like jagged wing edges and some of them look like leaves and stuff, um, but that's not really seemingly important for flight. It's more important uh, as a defense or, or you know, camouflage or something like that. So those kinds of things are uh, more relevant there. So once they lose them, then the next time they're... <laughs> That's right. So yeah. that's a very good point. I mean, they have they have two tails, and this is actually something I've wondered about. You know, some butterflies and some other moths they have more than two tails. Some of them have four, right? Mm -hmm. These elaborate uh, things, like the, the butterfly that I showed a picture of actually has six tails. So you know, maybe maybe the reason why they have so many is because you know you get bit by a predator, and then oh yeah, you lose one or two of them, but you still have two or four of them or whatever left over, and then you can still you know you have better survival. Um, we don't know this, but I, I suspect that there's some, some element of that happening there. Cool. Thank you. Very yeah. interesting. Nice. Yeah, talk. I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. So one other thing I wanted to just mention that I think is really interesting is that these, these long tailed moths, right? Like the very, very long tailed moths, um, they have these, like, uh, the, the tips of the moth tails are actually, um, white or, 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 um, yellowish. And if you look in the collections, they're just always seemingly always like that. And um, I didn't talk about this at all, but it also it actually, I think has to do or we think it has to do with vision. So bats can actually see contrast. So there's a there's not just echoes that are coming off of the tail, but there's also contrasting like light that comes off moonlight. And I think the bats are lured to that area because of the, the contrasting colors of the, the tail versus the very tip of the tail, which is very different. Hey, Matt, good to see you. <laughs> so, hey. Sorry. <laughs> hey, we enjoyed your talk <laughs> very much. It's good, good to, to see, see everybody. It. Yes. <laughs> um, are there any other questions? Or are, there, are these questions in the chat that I need to answer or something? Sorry, I haven't been paying attention to anything. There's, there's a lot of comments about how good the talk was there, but uh, I don't oh, know thank if you. there's any more questions. Somebody else raised their hand. Um, Is there uh, Fred? Yes, thank you. How are you? Thank you so much. Uh, excellent talk. I, I was just curious. I don't know enough about bats, but when you were talking about the toxic moths, and I know there's quite a few of them that exude some pretty, pretty uh, distinctive uh, odors that we can smell very easily on your fingers if you handle the moths. Can bats sense that when they're flying? I love these questions. <laughs> like most of the questions I, I my answer is we don't know. Like we don't know. Like yes, okay. we know that bats can smell. I was smell, wondering but... if olfaction plays a role. Oh, yeah. I don't know. I mean, my guess is probably, right? I mean, uh -huh. yeah, you're right. Like some of these like tiger moths and stuff, like they smell really bad. And beetles, like maybe that's what it is. Like with the beetles, maybe they just stink. Right, like maybe like the scarabs and stuff. Maybe they fly really slowly because they smell like poop, and bats don't want to smell that, and they just like give up because they smell so bad. Or maybe they're like, you know, I don't know. Yeah, but it's 
they just smell bad. I, I have no idea. It's a great question. We don't know. <laughs> but somebody could do an experiment. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's actually I, not I, like impossible. Yeah. <laughs> If you've handled enough arctic moths, you know how pungent they can be. So yeah, yeah, I just wondered. Thank you. No, that's a great question. Um, and it's making me think a little bit. I'm gonna like start to after this talk, I'm gonna look into some stuff, I think. So I'm kind of now curious about that. Great. Thanks. Any other questions? I don't see any more. So um, thank you so much. We really appreciate you uh, joining us tonight. Um, yeah. I, I was thinking about your um, your paper about you know things that everybody could could do if you wanted mm -hmm. to either send a, a reprint a, a, PD, a PDF of it or a link. I could forward that to the membership if anybody else is interested. Sure, sure. Happy to do that. I'll I'll send it over uh, right after this. Oh, question still. Is there is Jill? Do you have your hand up? I think you're muted. Um, a quick one, that very abbreviated um, writing of a paper in three days. Do you want to comment on that? That's amazing. Should everybody do so, that? I think so. You know, you know, it's actually kind of funny. You know, this, this thing it really opened my eyes to, to like how people work and stuff. And this is, you know, it was just, um, you know, I wanted to do this paper and, and I thought, okay, this could be a lab project, right? There's, you know, a bunch of us in the lab that are interested. So I just like recruited students and said, whoever wants to do this, like we're going to do this trip. I'm going to pay for the whole thing. Just come along. And so we went, everybody just brought their laptops and we broke it down into sections, right? Like everybody was responsible for like, I don't remember what it was, like two paragraphs or something, but we would reconvene every like three or four hours or whatever it was. And, and then we would, we'd be working on a Google doc. So it was very clear who was slacking, you know, it was usually me just slacking. So I would have to like catch up and try to write more and stuff and secrecy on the side. But anyway, the point was that this actually really worked very well because everybody was responsible. We had a clear aim and a goal. The goal was after three days to have a draft done. And we actually was able to put that together and submit it, which is, I, I just, I still cannot believe we were able to do that. And unfortunately we never did that again. And I guess because it, maybe pandemic is a good reason and excuse, but, but I'd love to do that again. And I think it was extremely effective and it built a lot of camaraderie with students and, and it was just really fun. And I, and I want to do that again. Another question, Fred, is your hand still up? Um, I guess it is. Not, I just wanted to comment. I do appreciate that you uh, put in at the end of your talk the uh, the drastic declines that are being seen across the board in insect populations everywhere. I've been reading some papers that came out of uh, the West area with Art Shapiro doing transect studies and NABA data that is being included. And the, the losses, they, they're pinning it uh, try, or trying to make some kind of um, connection with climate change and it appears that there's quite a bit. And of course, when you start looking at the botany and how plants get affected by drought and all that, and that extends directly to the Lepidopter and many other insects too. So uh, thank you for, for bringing that up and, um, you know, just being all, all those other aspects of stewardship and uh, trying to do public awareness. I do that all the time. I can't stand it when I go to Home Depot and I see those pesticides on gallons of it. Buy two, get one free, kills everything in your yard right away, you know. And, and that's the society we live in, unfortunately. But thanks for all the commentary on that. Yeah, no problem. I have to, I have to agree with Fred here. This is Matt. Yeah, the, the I think the, the what I loved about your paper, Akito, is it, it gave you like, these are the things you can do because it, it, it empowers the reader instead of this, um, oh my gosh, we're never gonna overcome this. It's like, these are the things you can do. We can all do this. And I think um, it's it's about time to really start um, putting the, the rubber to the road with this stuff. And- Yeah, we have to, I totally agree with you. And try to get the message yeah. out. And, and I think, you know, entomologists are the key players here because we have the most to kind of lose. And, you know, um, People love love their birds, you know. So this is, uh, I think, is we just need to keep the message going. And and also, I think the other thing about your paper I, I appreciated was it's not a, it wasn't so doomsday because that also doesn't work. 
Because if people just go, well, then we're screwed. It's too late, you know? And, and you have to give them some hope, I think. Yeah. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I think, um, you know, there, there's, there's things we all can do, right? And I tell my daughter this, and, you know, it's important to, you know, think about uh, planting trees in your yard and, and like, let's go look at the bugs. And, and, and like, just even, you know, she brings her friends over or whatever, and we look at bugs together. And like that kind of stuff, the, the, the knowledge transfer to, to children um, as entomologists and natural history people, I think is so, so fundamentally important. And um, we just need more people in the world that really care about the natural world. And I think um, bugs are really great because they are, they are literally, you don't have to worry about anything. You can handle them. You don't need permits all the time and all this kind of stuff. You can find them in your backyard, right? You can find them on your porch. Uh, they're just, and all it needs is, is just like some little bit of time and just look at them, you know, and not think of crushing them or going to Home Depot and just eliminating everything. Because that's not really right, you know. We, they were here before we were, right? And so, yeah, it makes me, I think it's a very good point. Uh, and Fred, too. Thank you. <laughs> All right, is that? <laughs> Am I supposed to? I think uh, I think um, uh, Al's gonna end the meeting. Al. <laughs> oh, Jamie. Yeah, well, yeah, we'll, I can. We'll... Go ahead, Al. No, uh, that's fine. Go ahead. I just wanted to say thanks again. We're all we're all clapping. Uh, you can't hear it, but you did a great, it's okay. you, great you job. We really appreciate it. Pretty, you know, <laughs> booing me. It's okay. I understand. <laughs> well, I guess there's like a clap, clap, and a thumbs up signal that uh, symbol that people can put on. I don't know how to do that myself. No. Yeah. Thanks so much, Akira. That was a great talk. Yeah. Really thanks again. It. It's really great to be with you guys too. I mean, I know it's a virtual, weird kind of setting, but. Um, yeah, I miss, I miss, like, I spent a lot of time there as a grad student, and yeah, it just makes me think about that society, you, know, you guys' society, it's great, so keep up the good work. Yeah, it's well, been, it's been kind of a mixed blessing, because, like, we never thought about doing Zoom before, so now, like, you know, lots of our members who aren't local can participate, so we're gonna try to, you know, keep a hybrid system going once we can go back to in person. It sounds great. Keep up the great work. I'd love to join and listen to some more talks sometime. Thanks so much. Thanks again, Nikito. Um, so just before we finish up, I just have a couple quick announcements. The next meeting will be Thursday, November 7th, or excuse me, November 4th at 7 p.m. The speaker will be Dr. Julia Urban from Penn State University. Or, and she'll be presenting some of her research about the spotted lanternfly. So it should be one of definite interest to a lot of people. Unfortunately, I'll be away um, for that meeting. So our um, president-elect, Lourdes Tremora, will be leading the, uh, leading the meeting. And with that, I, does anybody have any last comments or um, anything else before we adjourn? <laughs>